welcome back continuing with week 3 18th and 19th century literature and here are the exercises. Read the following extract from a poem. At once with joy and fear his heart rebounds, thus incorporeal spirits to smallest forms reduce their shapes immense and were at large, though without number still amidst the hall of that infernal court, but far within and in their own dimensions like themselves, the great seraphim, lords and cherubim, in close recess and secret conclave sat a thousand demigods on golden seats, frequent and full. After short silence then and summons read, the great consult began. Question 1. What is the genre of this poem? A. Gothic, B. Epic, C. Romantic, D. Allegory. Question 2. What is the meter used in the poem? A. Blank verse, B. Iambic tetrameter, C. Petrarchan sonnet and D. It is a heroic couplet. What is the meter? Question 3. Identify the poem. It is the same poem. A. The Pilgrim's Progress, B. The Divine Comedy, C. Paradise Lost, D. Enid. Next, identify this work. This famous book bears the subtitle, The Life and Opinions of Herr Teufelsdrock. It is a subtitle, not the main title. Main title is something else. So, A. Dr. Faustus, B. The Magic Mountain, C. Sartus Resartus D. Shamela. Next one, you have to identify the profession of the speaker. Which profession does the speaker belong to? It is the fate of those who toil at the lower employments of life to be rather driven by the fear of evil than attracted by the prospect of good, to be exposed to censor without uh, hope of praise, to be disgraced by miscarriage or punished for neglect, where success would have been without applause and diligence without reward. So, choose the correct response A poet, B lexicographer, C soldier, D politician. Next, answer the following. Mario Pras in the Romantic Agony, his classic study of the literature of decadence, identified dash as the forerunner of the decadent movement in England. Which person is he talking about? A. Oscar Wilde, B. Stephen Mellame, C. Walter Pater, D. Jean Baudelaire. Number 7. Which theory is being talked about in the following passage? Author can't control the text as soon as he writes. It becomes public. The critic should not interpret the allusions in, term, in terms of author's intention. They claim that author's intended meaning is irrelevant to the literary critic. The meaning, structure, value of text is inherent within the work of art itself. It is an object with certain autonomy. Choose the correct response A. Classicism, B. Intentional fallacy, C. Reader response theory, D. Romanticism. Number 8. Which novel bears this dedication at the beginning? The other day we saw uh, The Way of the World, right? The uh, dedication. Now, this is another dedication to W. M. Thackeray Square. This work is respectfully inscribed by the author. Now, W. M. Thackeray is William Makepeace Thackeray, the uh, author of Vanity Fair. Which novel bears this dedication at the beginning? Your choices are identify the novel A. Vanity Fair, B. Wuthering Heights, C. Jane Eyre, D. Middlemarch. Next one, read the following. I am come home. I lost my way on the moor. As it spoke, I discerned obscurely a child's face looking through the window. Terror made me cruel and finding it useless to attempt shaking the creature off, 
I pulled its wrist onto the broken pane and rubbed it to and fro till the blood ran down and soaked the bedclothes. Still it wailed. Let me in and maintain its tenacious grip, almost maddening me with fear. How can I? I said at length. Let me go if you want me to let you in. The fingers relaxed. I snatched mine through the hole, hurriedly piled the books up in a pyramid against it and stopped my ears to exclude the lamentable prayer. I seemed to keep them closed above a quarter of an hour, yet the instant I listened again. There was the doleful cry moaning on. Be gone, I shouted. I'll never let you in, not if you beg for twenty years. It is twenty years, moaned the voice. Twenty years. I've been away for twenty years. There had begun a feeble scratching outside, and the pile of books moved as if thrust forward. I tried to jump up, but could not stir a limb, and so yelled aloud in a frenzy of fright. To my confusion, I discovered the yell was not ideal. Hasty footsteps approached my chamber door. Somebody pushed it open with a vigorous hand, and a light glimmered through the squares at the top of the bed. I sat shuddering yet and wiping the perspiration from my forehead. The intruder appeared to hesitate and muttered to himself. At last, he said in a half whisper, plainly not expecting an answer. Is anyone here? Who is the narrator? A. Harriton, B. Linton, C. Lockwood, D. Nelly. Which meaning corresponds to wave here? A. Orphan, B. Ragamuffin, C. Homeless, D. Urchin. Number 11, based on the same passage. Which genre does the work belong to? A. Romantic, B. Detective. C. Gothic, D. Decadent. Next one, answer the following. Who is the author of Myth and Meaning, The Raw and the Cooked and Tristis Tropiques? A. Claude Lévi-Strauss. B. Jean Baudrillard. C. Roland Bart. D. Michel Foucault. Next one, answer the following. A song about the dash is still sung by children. Ring a ring of roses. What event is that? A. The Great Fire of London. B. Guy Fawkes Day. C. Children's Day. D. The Great Plague. Number 14. Identify the martyr. The life of this martyr has been documented by Lord Tennyson, Jean Ennui, and T. S. Eliot. Who is the martyr? A. Thomas Beckett, B. Thomas Cromwell, C. Thomas More, D. Joan of Arc. Number 15. Read the following. This play contains an explicit articulation of a major dash theme. Man is the spiritual creator, whereas woman is the biological life force that must always triumph over him. Which is the theme? A. Socratic, B. Platonic, C. Byronic, D. Shavian. Next question. Read the following stanza. Alas, alas, who is injured by my love? What merchant's ships have my sighs drowned? Who says my tears have overflowed his ground? When did my coals a forward spring remove? When did the heats which my veins fill add one more to the Plaguey bill, soldiers find wars and lawyers find out still. Litigious men which quarrels move, though she and I do love. Here are your choices. So, this is the question. Number 16, who is the poet? A. Andrew Marvel, B. John Dunn, C. John Milton, D. John Dryden. Next one. Read the following. My father, a wise and grave man, gave me serious and excellent counsel against what he foresaw was my design. He called me one morning into his chamber where he was confined by the gout and expostulated very warmly with me upon this subject. He asked me what reasons more than a mere wandering inclination I had for leaving father's house and my native country where I might be 
well introduced and had a prospect of raising my fortune by application and industry with a life of ease and pleasure. He told me it was men of desperate fortunes on one hand or of aspiring superior fortunes on the other who went abroad upon adventures to rise by enterprise and make themselves famous in undertakings of a nature out of the common road that these things were all either too far above me or too far below me that mine was the middle state or what might be called the upper station of low life which he had found by long experience was the best state in the world the most suited to human happiness not um, exposed to the miseries and hardships the labor and sufferings of the mechanic part of mankind and not embarrassed with the pride luxury ambition and envy of the upper part of mankind look at the questions 17th identify the work a frankenstein b gulliver's travels c robinson crusoe d treasure island question 18 what's the dominant literary device used here a foreshadowing b satire c euphemism d allegory number 19 read the following extract a glooming peace this morning with it brings the sun for sorrow will not show his head go hence to have more talk of these sad things some shall be pardoned and some punished for never was a story of more woe than this of juliet and her romeo look at the question now this extract is an ex example of a prologue b invocation c euphemism d epilogue Number 20, look at the slide here, identify the play. This play is set in a spa town. The hero is a scientist who discovers that the spa has contaminated water or waters. It was adapted by Arthur Miller in 1950. Identify the play, A, an enemy of the people, B, a dream play, C, the miser, D, the inspector general. Number 21, answer the following, did I request thee maker from my clay to mould me man, did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me. Question is identify where these lines appear on the title page, on the title page. I am not asking you who the real writer, actual writer is, but somebody quoted and inscribed it on the title page. A. Wuthering Heights, B. Dracula, C. Jane Eyre, D. Frankenstein. So, let us discuss the answers now. Uh, first one is Paradise Lost of course and B. Epic, the answer is B. Epic. Second is A. Blank Verse, it is written in blank verse, not in Petrarchan stanza or any sonnet form. Third C, that is Paradise Lost by John Milton. Fourth is again C, Sartus Resartus, answer the life and opinions of Herr Teufelsdrock. An extremely interesting work, Sartus Resartus by Carlyle. Fifth is B, Lexicographer is from Samuel Johnson, Dr. Samuel Johnson, the greatest lexicographer. Number 6 is C, Walter Pater, forerunner of the decadent movement. That is where you get Mario Praz saying, you should know who Walter Pater was. Who is Walter Pater? How many of you know him or heard of him? An English critic, essayist and humanist, art for art's sake. He advocated art for art's sake, do not he did not coin it, okay. but he is associated with the uh, coinage, the phrase art for art's sake. Art should have no intrinsic value, no didacticism, no preachiness, but should exist only for the sake of beauty. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is like the mantra for aesthetics 
on East the theory of aestheticism movement called aestheticism. So, Walter Pater adds one of the most seminal practitioner. He lived between 1839 to 1894. He was educated at King's School, Canterbury and at Queen's College, Oxford, where he studied Greek philosophy. I tell you these uh, uh, pieces of information, these bits of information which may not really be uh, extremely in depth observations, where was, where did he get educated or what was his father's profession, you know, but of late we find that such kinds of questions are becoming more and more familiar for com uh, literature. Uh, for competitive purpose exams kind of thing. So, these they, therefore, it is I think it is relevant to know this these details also. Uh, Peter started writing the reviews and then he wrote some very important landmark kind of essays on Leonardo da Vinci, Botticelli, Mirandola, Michelangelo. So, all these Renaissance artists and all these essays were collected in a collection which, appear, which was published in 1873 as studies in the history of the Renaissance. I am jumping a bit 19th century he belonged to the 19th century we I know we are still late 17th and early 18th and mid 18th centuries, but I could not resist Walter Pater is important and since his name came up, so we should know something about it. Uh, all he is also known for his fastidious sensitive style and his uh, appreciation of Renaissance art in these essays uh, marked his reputation as a scholar and aesthet. In the concluding essay in the Renaissance that is his collection, Pater asserted that art exists for the sake of its beauty alone and that it acknowledges uh, neither moral standards nor utilitarian functions for its existence. So, this is important. These views uh, brought Pater into an association with Swinburne and with the other well known pre-Raphaelites. It is important that you know who were the pre-Raphaelites. Look these uh, people up and also their works. I have seen on a number of occasions or uh, competitive exams setting questions on the pre Raphaelites. Please go through that very carefully, that movement very carefully. Peter's another substantial work was uh, his 1885 work called Marius the Epicurean. The setting is Rome in the time of Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor, but actually this is a thinly veiled uh, description of uh, uh, the late 19th century spiritual development. He also wrote in 1889 Appreciations, which is a return to critical essays and uh, this time based on English subjects, not Roman or Greeks. And then in 1893, he wrote Plato and Platonism. Okay, so, that is very important. These works, what do they stand for? Renaissance, Marius the Epicurean, Plato, etcetera. Go through them, understand what these works are all about. You may get something from them, one can never tell. Seventh is B, intentional fallacy. It is a term used in 20th century literary criticism. I, I am sure those who are uh, those of you who are into literary criticism or doing your courses in literary theory and criticism, they must have come across uh, the two terms intentional and affective fallacy. The idea here is to describe the problem, the folly inherent in trying to judge a work of art by assuming the intent or purpose of the artist who created it. The term intentional fallacy was introduced by two people jointly, W. K. Wimsett Jr. and Monroe C. Beardsley. So, Wimsett Beardsley, 
The book was called The, in the Verbal Icon in 1954. The approach was a reaction to the popular belief that to know what the author intended was to know the correct interpretation of the work. So, a theory which still is oft quoted and holds true. Number 8 is C. Jane Eyre and number 9 is the character of Lockwood C. Number 10 again based on Wuthering Heights, wave here is homelessness, not ragamuffin or not an orphan. We are talking about Catherine Linton's ghost that is trying to get in. Okay, now a story that has ghosts and dungeons and dark places and secrets, secrets of the mind as well, terror, okay, psychological terror and disturbances. What are they called? So, the genre of this novel, question 11, is C Gothic. You should know that. Typical settings in a gothic fiction are medieval buildings and ruins. Such kinds of fiction, uh, they use castles, monasteries, all these have you know uh, hidden dark passages, um, panels, old creaky doors, trap doors. Uh, the genre was initiated in England especially by someone called Horace Walpole, his book called Castle of Otranto, which was uh, a late 18th century book in 1765 to be precise. Um, Walpole's book was a success and this was followed by Mysteries of Udolpho in 1794 by someone called Anne Redcliffe who also wrote Italian. These are the best examples of this genre. Later works of, um, uh, you know, later on uh, seminal works like the works of the Bronte sisters, the works by Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne and uh, some passages from Dickens's Bleak House and Great Expectations. For example, wherever he discusses or describes um, Miss Havisham, they can be categorized as Gothic, although Dickens, as we all know, is not strictly speaking a Gothic novelist. But uh, such uh, far reaching and pervading was the influence and attraction for the Gothic that even a social realist like Dickens could not escape the charms of it. Um, I would like you to take a look at this example from Gothic passage, Jane Eyre. Returning, I had to cross before the looking glass. My fascinated glance involuntarily explored the depth it revealed. All looked colder and darker in that visionary hollow than in reality. And the strange little figure there gazing at me with a white face and arms specking the gloom and glittering eyes of fear moving where all else was still had the effect of a real spirit. I thought it like one of the uh, tiny phantoms, half fairy, half imp, Bessie's evening stories represented as coming out of lone ferny dells in moors and appearing before the eyes of belated travellers. Look at all the words that give you clear give away. And I want you to look at another passage, again an example of the gothic fiction, The Fall of the House of Usher and Other Tales, 1839 by Edgar Allan Poe. During the whole of a dull, dark and soundless day in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, I had been passing alone on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country. In three lines you can see so much of, you know, tropes of, so many tropes of the Gothic. And at length found myself as the shades of the evening drew on within view of the melancholy house of Usher. I know not how it was, but with the first glimpse of the building, a sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit. I say insufferable, for the feeling 
was unrelieved by any of that half pleasurable because poetic sentiment with which the mind usually receives even the sternest natural images of the desolate or terrible. I looked upon the scene before me, upon the mere house and the simple landscape features of the domain, upon the bleak walls, upon the vacant eye-like windows, upon a few rank sedges and upon a few white trunks of decayed trees with an utter depression of soul which I can compare to no earthly sensation more properly than to the after dream of the reveller upon opium, the bitter lapse into everyday life, the hideous dropping off of the veil. There was an iciness, a sinking, a sickening of the heart, an unredeemed dreariness of thought which no goading of the imagination could torture into aught of the sublime. Notice the language, notice the tropes, the words, all pointing towards the Gothic. Number 12, answer is A, theorist, uh, the theorist is Claude Levi Strauss, myth and meaning, the raw and the cooked and tristes tropics or tropics. So, Claude Levi Strauss, the venerable anthropologist. When we talk about the poem, the rhyme, lovely little children's rhyme, ring a ring of roses, the answer is 13 D, it refers to the great plague. It may come as a surprise that it is not a children's day rhyme, but it was sung in memory of the great plague. The martyr who has been documented by Tennyson, Onway and also um, T.S. Eliot is Thomas Beckett, answer is A and 15 is D. This play contains an explicit articulation of a major Shavian theme related to Bernard Shaw. Man is the spiritual creator whereas woman is the biological life force that must always triumph over him. It is taken from or it refers to man and superman, so Shavian theme. Number 16 is A, Andrew Marvel and number 17 is C, Robinson Crusoe. The passage where the father, a grave solemn father advises his son to refrain, the narrator to refrain from adventuring or from sea adventures. And what literary device is it? It is foreshadowing A. So, answer is A to the 18th question. Why foreshadowing? Because in the advice where he is a sort of uh, told not to uh, travel by the sea, and the mishaps eventually happen. He is stranded on a, a cut off island for almost 20 or so years in the company, alone in the company of his Friday or man Friday as we know him. 19 is D, epilogue and what is an epilogue that a playwright uses those lines to conclude his work, so epilogue. It can even be a part of a novel epilogue, concluding lines, commenting on what has happened, lamenting in the case of Rome, Romeo and Juliet. Prologue is the way it begins, a, a work begins, here it is an epilogue. 20, answer A, an enemy of the people by the great Norwegian Henry Ibsen. Arthur Miller, who was a great admirer of Ibsen for his social realism, adapted it in uh, mid 20th century. Number 21 is D. Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Frankenstein published in 1818 and these lines appear on the title page of the novel and allude to John Milton's Paradise Lost. So, remember Paradise Lost is one of the most important works, there is no getting away. Chaucer, Milton, 
Shakespeare, okay, they are the classics and there is no getting away. In Paradise Lost, the lines when Adam mo uh, bemoans his fallen condition, that is in book 10, and in Frankenstein, the monster conceives of himself as a tragic figure, comparing himself to both Adam and Satan. From here, we move on to another key uh, event or key age rather, I have been talking about this for uh, quite some time, the Augustan age. Now, Augustan age is one of the most illustrious periods in Latin literary history uh, from 40, uh, 43 BC to AD 18. Now, together with the preceding Ciceronian period, it forms the golden age of Latin literature. This was marked by civil peace and prosperity and the age reached its highest literary expression in poetry, which was considered a very sophisticated and polished form of expression, generally addressed to a patron or to the emperor Augustus, who was a patron in most cases. And uh, these poems dealt, uh, works dealt with the themes of patriotism, love, nature, etc. Between 29 to 19 BC, we had some of the best works of the Augustan age, Virgil's Georgics and also the completion of his magnum opus epic Enid. With the uh, period also witnessed the appearance of Horace's Odes. So, we have something called Horatian Ode. We will do romanticism and then we will talk about Ode and uh, indebtedness to Horace also. This was also a period when uh, um, epistles was published and also the elegies of Sextus Propertius. Sextus Propertius, that is a, again a Roman luminary. This period Again, during this period, Levi, L I V Y, began his history of Rome. Ovid wrote uh, the uh, the author of Metamorphoses. He was uh, also uh, very active during the Augustan age, perhaps the last great writer of this age, the Golden Age. He died in exile in A.D. 17 which marked the close of this period. Now, the name Augustan age, the reason I am talking about this is one is extremely important from competitive exams point of view, especially the international kinds. Uh, it is important also because it is applied to a classical period in the literature of any nation, particularly we are referring to the 18th century in England and less uh, frequently to the 17th century in France, when people like uh, Racine, Corniel and Moliere were writing. Okay. Uh, there was a time of Queen Anne between 1702 and 1714 and this is considered the peak of the Augustan age, when writers such as Alexander Pope, Richard Steele, uh, of course, Joseph Edison, I have been talking about him quite a, for quite a while and John Gay, also Matthew Pryor, they all flourished. Others uh, may also, uh, there are scholars who may extend this period uh, backward to include John Dryden and also forward uh, to include Dr. Samuel Johnson. So, that is the Augustan age in England a period of great um, and robust intellectualism. For the next couple of minutes, I will be uh, discussing some major European writers. So, Baudelaire, the 19th century writer who uh, claimed to have been destined to eternal solitude. You should remember Baudelaire one of the key names of aestheticism and decadence, art for art's sake. So, um, his motto was 
or rather more his observation on his own life was destined to eternal solitude. Um, in his early life, in his young age, he was put into a military school, he hated this life. Later on, his family sent him on a voyage to Calcutta, but he left the ship. He was always an adventurer, a misfit and a rule breaker. He spent three weeks on the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. In Paris, in the bohemian crowd of the Latin Quarter, there was a, a street area, Latin quarter where called, uh, um, you know, where artists would uh, indulge in free spirited, free thinking discussions and activities. So, um, he felt at home in this crowd, the bohemian crowd. Soon he ran out of his inheritance, but was happy. He associated with, uh, he got associated with artists, writers, and two cults associated with the name Baudelaire, dandyism and art for art's sake or aestheticism. Dandyism and art, by art I mean art for art's sake here. Okay? So, remember this is your Baudelaire. Now, remember dandyism was the cult of the ego, a ceremony or ceremonial with severe laws. To be original, to be emotionally restrained, to be independent of every social tie to family, friends or nation, to despise the bourgeoisie, the riffraff, okay? that is the cult of dandyism. Baudelaire's passion for art was more important for him than anything else and I quote him, literature must come before everything else, before my hunger, before my pleasure, before my mother, quotable quote, before my hunger, before my pleasure, before my mother, literature. His early art criticism was distinguished for uh, its keen sensibility, but um, around 1846 his discovery of a uh, few fragments of Edgar Allan Poe's poems, they excited him. He started uh, on a 17 year task, a translation of Poe's works and he called them Tales, T-A-L-E-S. In it, 1857 appeared his uh, single volume of poetry. The Flowers of Evil, Le Fleur du Mall. It was followed by Artificial Paradise, parts of which was translated from Thomas de Quincy. However, Baudelaire owes his fame to Les uh, Fleur du Mall, published in 1857. The book was criticized, castigated, condemned, and several of its poems banned. You can look them up, look this uh, event up. Baudelaire felt that it, it inspired only fear and horror of evil. At his heart, he was a counter romantic, disliking the vagueness and exuberance and emotionality of the romantic. Soon we are going to do the romantics in detail. Okay, so, then we will be referring to Baudelaire again. Another important figure. Gauthier to whom he dedicated his book, uh, Baudelaire learned the discipline of form. So, Baudelaire owed the discipline of form to uh, Gauthier. So, when you look up your literary terms book, M. H. Abrams literary terms, you will find the first entry, uh, one of the first entry under A is aestheticism and you will find all these names, Gauthier, Wilde. Baudrillo, I am sorry Baudelaire, not Baudrillo, not the critic Baudrillo, but Baudelaire. Now, although he admired Gauthier's objectivity, Baudelaire's commitment was towards subjectivity. He had a horror and terror of the commonplace. He said, we do evil without effort naturally, good is always the product of art. So, that is how important art or pursuit or dedication to art was to him. 
we do evil without effort that means evil comes naturally to us. He also felt that virtue and beauty are always artificial that is contrived by art. Without art there is no virtue, no beauty. He also felt that poetry should be free of preachiness whether ethical, metaphysical, political or economic. There is a, a work in La Voyage uh, which is the last poem in the original Le Fleur de Mal and he expresses his wish to plunge into the gulf no matter whether hell or heaven to find at the bottom of the unknown something different and I want you to uh, underscore different to plunge into the gulf. It does not matter you find whether you find hell or heaven, but I am after the different. Unfortunately, his last years were tragic. He had uh, lost his in inheritance. Um, he was given to much drinking. He was broke and suffered several paralytic strokes. At the end, he was even uh, unable to remember his own name or recognize his face in a mirror. He died in 1867. His posthumous books are uh, or works are intimate journals and they consist of two parts, squips and my heart laid bare. These are fragmentary books or sorry works, but they show his development from dandyism to religious humility. As the first of the decadence, you know decadent movement, Baudelaire influenced English poets such as um, Swinburne, Algernon, Charles Swinburne and Dowson, Ernest Dowson. But his influence is far reaching. Uh, for example, he was one of the precursors of French symbolism. He has been called the starting point for subsequent French poetry and for English poetry from Pound and Yeats onward. So, Baudelaire. I also want you to know what T. S. Eliot thought of him uh, and he said, the nearest thing to a complete renovation that we have experienced that is Baudelaire. Take a look at this line and these are selected quotes from Baudelaire. One should always be drunk, that is all that matters, but with what? With wine, with poetry or with virtue as you choose, but get drunk. Always be a poet, even in prose. A book is a garden, an orchard, a storehouse, a party, a company by the way, a counsellor, a multitude of counsellors. And the last one I have deliberately italicized, you have to tell me where it occurs in popular culture. The devil's finest trick is to persuade you that he does not exist. This line was used in Brian Singer's The Usual Suspects. From Baudelaire, that is France, we move to Russia. Anton Chekhov, one of the most important writers to grow out of the pre-revolutionary Russia of 19, that is uh, before 1917, so pre-revolutionary Russia. Chekhov lived between 1860 and 1904. One of his major problems was the monotonous life in Russia, the stultifying effects of Russian life. He said it is very boring, very monotonous, one day is very much like another. This is what he wrote just before his death. Shekhov, among other things, is credited for something called the technique of understatement. Also notable is his uh, creation, the figure of the unheroic hero. We all know the definition of the ideal tragic hero or literary heroes, but a Shekhovian hero is an unheroic hero. So this this found resonance with many. Uh, of his counterparts in modern literature. The unheroic hero first emerged in Chekhov's play Ivanov, which was an 1889 play in which uh, man is portrayed as being oppressed by the dullness and the commonplaceness of life. 
The best known plays are of course The Seagull, The Cherry Orchard, Three Sisters and Uncle Vanya. This is in 1902, little before his death. They give us a glimpse of life but no beginning or end to the action. Critics may say his plays ended in a whimper, not with a bang. The uniqueness of Chekhov lies in that the action is veiled most of the time and unveiled suddenly but quietly and undramatically and offering no judgment and no morals. I will be talking about uh, the cherry orchard, but before that look at select quotes from Chekhov here from three sisters. Within another 24 or 30 years, everyone will work, everyone is said by someone who does not work. Again from three sisters, do you see that tree? It is dead, but it still sways in the wind with the others. I think it would be like that with me, that if I died, I would still be part of life in one way or another. And again look at this slide. In Life and Letters, what he says on civilized people, very interesting remark. What do civilized people do not do? They do not run themselves down in order to provoke the sympathy of others. They do not play on other people's heart strings to be uh, sighed over and uh, cosseted. That sort of thing is just cheap striving for effects. It is vulgar, old hat and false. And from the seagull, I dress in black to match my life. I am unhappy. Here is what Konstantin Stanislavski, the precursor of the so called method acting, director of the art theatre in Moscow, what he says. He wrote of Chekhov's plays in My Life in Art. They are plays written on the simplest themes which in themselves are not interesting, but they are permeated by the eternal and he who feels this quality in them perceives that they are written for all eternity. Okay, so, we move on to Chekhov's uh, uh, The Cherry Orchard before winding up today's class. This is a 1904 play. Here in the simple image of the cherry orchard, Chekhov found a symbol of a complicated problem that is the social, economic and general cultural change which Russia was facing the decay, decline of one era and the rise of a new. Such themes have been dealt with by several writers from across the world, from across different countries. So, Cherry Orchard is the Russian response to change that happened in Russia. So, this is quite symbolical, the orchard undergoes the same fate as Russia to the feudal landowning class of the old tradition represented by Madame Renovsky, one of the characters, the estates meant Russia, a land of private property, ruled and enjoyed only by the rulers. The idea is how the ownership is handed over to the next class of people. Chekhov's conviction was that to judge between good and bad, between successful and unsuccessful would need the eye of God. Who is right, who is wrong, we are no one to judge. This statement explains why he did not portray his characters as they should be, but as they really are. He just showed a mirror to people, but not the idealized characters or form of it. Chekhov never judged, but sympathized with his characters and that is something that the modernists were extremely influenced by. So, thank you very much. We will continue with uh, the European writers and I yeah, will uh, start with Henrik Ibsen in my next class.